with an ancient African greeting. I greet you, Hotep. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Giving praise and thanks to our Creator, who though hidden is the source of all life, the source of all power, the source of all health. Also, we must always acknowledge our ancestors whose work set the direction, whose sacrifices made it possible for us to be here, whose spirits still exist and who will join us if we call their name and hold their memories dear. Their patterns will continue to guide us in all our efforts. I'm very pleased to have been invited. Reverend Glasgow, thank you very much for the invitation to be here as a part of your African Pride observance in this Sunday morning service. I'm also very happy to be here because I'm bonded to you, whether you know it or not. Uh, I'm bonded to you because uh, I'm AME, St. Mark's AME, and my service is the early service. <laughs> um, if I don't make it to the early service, I can't make it at all. Because I'll get to sleeping, and I'll sleep past service. But this African pride celebration is extremely important to us. When uh, my family and I had an, an opportunity in 1963 to go to Africa, I was delighted. I had been in a department meeting at San Francisco State, and all my life I had wanted to go to the African continent. And the, the announcement came, and they said there was a job opening in Liberia. And uh, I could hardly sit through the rest of the meeting for the hour that it took to complete it for fear that someone would beat me over to the application. And I ran halfway across the campus to get into the office and to apply for this job. And I applied for it and accepted the job before it was offered without knowing what the pay was. And I didn't care. I just wanted to go and I knew that it would give me an opportunity to take my family. So for six years, we lived in Liberia, and we had the most wonderful experience, probably the high point of my life, living and learning about the continent of Africa on location. I also remember that when we went to Washington, D.C., on our way to Liberia, we met in a hotel in D.C., and we were oriented by members of the State Department. And the State Department said to us, don't feel that you're going to go to a place where they like you. In fact, Africans don't like black people. In fact, they like Europeans better than they like black people. So just be careful, don't be disappointed, and everything will be all right. I found out later that when Africans came to the United States, they told them that black people don't like Africans. <laughs> and we had 63 Africans at San Francisco State at the time, uh, training them to be educators. And so I learned something in that experience that I had known a little about, but I hadn't realized how hard the work was to make sure that Africans were separated from each other, those across the water from those that are still on the continent. And so part of our miseducation about each other was the fact that we were taught that we were not together, that there was no connection, no real connection, no meaningful connection, that it was 400 years ago that we were connected, but by now all those things have been lost. That unfortunately has led us not to spend much time studying about the homeland. That has some very serious consequences, and I'll try to illustrate with one or two stories. The stories also said that one reason that you probably don't want to remember anyway is because Africa was a place that was underdeveloped. It was a place where there were people who were savages, 
meaning not civilized, pagans, meaning they didn't know God, underdeveloped, meaning that they had never made use of their environment in a way that would make a contribution to the world. Anyone who has studied Africa knows that all three of those statements are totally false. That we did know God, in fact, we were the first people to know God. That the African historians who have written on African history after examining every African group on the continent finds that there's almost no group that doesn't have in its native language before the time of colonization a word for God Almighty, a single God. Some seem as if they have many gods that they talk about, but they're more like angels. They all have a word for God Almighty, and there are many terms that are used. So we knew God before anyone tried to convert Africans to God. We were not underdeveloped. In fact, we were the most developed continent in the world. And for thousands of years, we led the world in technology. We led the world in architecture. We led the world in science, in astronomy, and so forth, especially in the Nile Valley, but not only in the Nile Valley. You can go back to the time of 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. And at 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, I picked that date because at that time, there was no other nation in the world. Greece was not even in existence as a city-state or set of city-states. And Africans had already built pyramids and had established not just one, but several major nations that were high technology. Later, they would establish high technology centers all over the continent from Timbuktu with the University of Sankare, where they taught law and medicine, where they taught uh, engineering, where they taught uh, the Quran, because they happened to be Muslims at that time, uh, all the way down to Zimbabwe in Southern Africa, where the story was that someone had come in from Asia or Europe and built those great stone monuments and that the Africans had kind of waited until someone came in and done that. And that simply is untrue. We now know that Zimbabwe, great Zimbabwe, the great stone monuments in Southern Africa are the intellectual genius of African people. So the underdevelopment thing was also untrue. It was not only untrue, it was untrue uh, not only for those reasons, it was also untrue because if you go back and look at what jump-started European civilization, every major philosopher of Greece, which was at the headwaters of what became truly a glorious civilization for Europe, as did Rome and so forth, but every major philosopher of Greece studied in Africa. Plato studied there for 12 years. Pythagoras studied there for 22 years, being taught by African professors in universities that had existed from 2000 BC and before, all the way back to 3000 BC. But the memory of the great accomplishments of Africans was kept from us, which is one of the reasons that so many of us have shame when we think of Africa, because we've been socialized not to know these things. And then, of course, the idea that we're not together. Well, some of us are not together. Those whose memories have been clouded about who they are and what they are are the ones who definitely are not together. On the other hand, there are many Africans who know that they belong to each other in the same way that people all over the world who come from different places on the earth maintain their ties, their ethnic ties with their families, even as they're open to associations with other people. We have this feeling that if we uh, unify and, and uh, build family connections to each other, that somehow that represents a rejection of other people in the world. That's not true. Uh, but it, it, I tell you this, uh, as uh, the minister said, uh, where the Bible says, you have to love your neighbor as yourself, the neighbors of many African people are in serious trouble. Because if we love our neighbors like we love ourselves, and some of us don't love ourselves, which means you don't have the capacity to love your neighbor either, in the words of the Bible. It was also true then that we are, for those of us who are knowledgeable together, those of us who have studied. I'm impressed by 
a young man, uh, uh, he was a young man when he did his work, named Ben Yehudi. And there's a book that he wrote called Tongue of the Prophets. Ben Yehudi was a young Jewish man. And he was a young Jewish man who used his history, respected his history, and he respected his people. So much so that he decided that he would make it his personal project to restore a language that was dead, Hebrew. Hebrew had died because no one other than the rabbis read Hebrew and then only a limited vocabulary just to be able to interpret the Hebrew scriptures. And then Ben Yehudi said, I would like for Hebrew to be a modern language so that my people can learn it and use it as a basis for identity. At a time where Jews were scattered all over the world, they were Germans, they were Americans, they were uh, Frenchmen, they were uh, Asian, they were everywhere. But he said, I would like to have something that builds unity in the community, so language would be the way to do it. And people laughed at him and said, that's foolish, that's stupid. Why would anybody, even if you created such a language, why would anybody use it when it's really much more important to use English or French because that's the national, international language of commerce and industry and so forth. Why would you do in this modern era, why would you do Hebrew? And so he created the Hebrew language. And then he did something else. He wanted his own two children to be the first people in 2,000 years who spoke Hebrew only as their first language. And he taught his children and he wouldn't let anybody come into the house, no one, until his children knew Hebrew. And once they knew Hebrew, then he opened up and introduced them to everyone else. That young man had provided then the basis for what became the state of Israel. Because the state of Israel now has as their national language a modern functioning language. They had to add vocabulary because they didn't have words like airport, airplane, in old Hebrew because there were none. But by the work of this single person, he was able to convince a group of people to claim a part of their history and to restore themselves. And then, of course, they used the history to make a 2,000-year-old land claim and went back into the Middle East and established the state of Israel. That's the example of how, the, how history, how culture is meaningful to you. Now, they still speak English. They still speak French. They still speak all those other things. But you cannot deny yourself and embrace everybody and everything else and be a whole and healthy people. So it becomes very important for us to look at examples like these because so many of us really have not done our homework. I understand those who say things like, I never left anything in Africa. <laughs> Malcolm X said, you left your mind in Africa. <laughs> So that we have to deal with this. We're unable, for example, let me give just a quick example. Some time ago, there was a, a controversy that erupted in Oakland, California, just two or three years ago. In December of that year, the word came out that uh, there was an Ebonics program in the school. I never saw so many people running for cover in December. It would be January, three weeks later, before you even knew what the controversy was about from the point of view of the people in Oakland. What was the Board of Education's position? No one even printed the board's position because we were under so much ridicule because it said that the Oakland people wanted to teach Ebonics in the school. That was not the position of the board. They said they wanted to acknowledge that Ebonics is spoken in the community and to respect the fact that that is a language spoken in the community and not to denigrate children when you teach them standard English. The program was standard English. But then we were ashamed. We had ministers leading major organizations that came out. I'm talking about African ministers opposed to Ebonics. We had heads of civil rights organizations castigating Ebonics. We had leaders who were castigating Ebonics in Ebonics. <laughs> because we were ashamed. 
because we didn't know. A simple study of ourselves would have taught us that we could explain why so many of the children in Detroit speak the way they speak. They speak the way they speak because their parents speak that way. And their parents speak that way because they have retained, in spite of 400 years of presence in the United States, they have retained features of languages of Africa in their own language. Most linguists don't know that. I work with the Center for Applied Linguistics. We did a book on Ebonics not long ago, and most of the greatest linguists don't know a single African language. So if you don't know the antecedent language, how can you explain what it's like now if you don't li know what it was like before? It turns out that there's a reason why we say fo, mo, and do. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with whether our tongues and lips are big, as the linguist said, and so you can't really articulate because of the shape, the size of the tongue and the shape of the lips. We say fo, mo, and do because the phonetic system of almost any African language requires that you put a vowel at the end of the word. We don't end our words in Africa with consonants. So you have Congo, Nigeria, Nkrumah, Jomo, Kenyatta. We always have vowels on the end of those words. And so when you are forced into a new language system to adopt a vocabulary that comes out of Scandinavia or somewhere out of one of the Russian countries where they may have five or six consonants at the end of the word, you have to make an adjustment because the strongest thing in anyone's language is the sound system. The explanation I'm giving you about that simple thing right now, you can't make unless you know yourself, unless you study yourself. So you find yourself being ashamed because of the absence of self-study. In the Ebonics program, they said that language was genetically related to African language. That really hurt us. And we had, I wish you could have seen the pain on the faces, even of some black linguists as they talked about that. Because they don't know linguistics. In linguistics, genetic relationship means two languages are not accidentally related to each other. It's no accident that they're related. Not DNA produces language. <laughs> not biology produces language. And they said it's racist what they say. It had nothing to do with race so that the people were beat up in Oakland and suffered a lot because the community itself couldn't stand up and say we're African people. And we sound this way because African people still say some of the features of the language, including some of the grammar. That's why we say I be, we be, he be, she be. And you go get the little boy's mother and bring them to school and say, Miss Jones, your boy has a speech impediment and a language disorder. And she said, what's wrong with him? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with him. There's nothing wrong with her. They have a language difference, not a language deficit. You have to be able to explain those things. That's just one example of why it's necessary to uh, understand ourselves in order to be able to hold our heads up and to have the pride that we're supposed to have. Again, because if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. That's the piece that I think we have to understand. 100 years ago, this year, in, April, in uh, July, there was a conference held in, Af in uh, London called the First Pan-African Conference. The people who headed it, people like Sylvester Williams out of the Caribbean, people like George Padmore out of Liberia, people like W.E.B. Du Bois out of the United States, went to London to try to repair the damage that had been done by propaganda and miseducation and misinformation and to join together the African family so that it would look like other families, like the Hebrews who got themselves back together again. Oh, they still associate with like, love, and do everything with other people, but they have to take care of home first. And we've never understood that. And until we understand that, we can't have any pride. We have a need to teach our children. We have a need to teach all of our children. We need to have the education of our children under our control. The public schools will not, and maybe never not, offer the specific education that our children need. That must be done in community. Your churches have to do that. 
In fact, that's what's done in other communities. Their churches do that. Their community organizations do that. You raise your children yourself. We're not doing that. And as a consequence, we're depending upon institutions that are not even competent to pass on the history. I worked in Portland, Oregon for almost 10 years developing uh, what we call baseline essays. And these were essays on different aspects of the African experience, our mathematical experience, Africa all the way to the present, our literary experience, Africa all the way to the present, our uh, uh, experience in science all the way from the past to the present. And we developed a set of essays. It was interesting. We got more flack about the essays just for talking about ourselves. We weren't castigating anybody. We were not talking bad about, we even, we even subdued our justifiable anger at oppression, slavery, and colonization. We hardly talked about that at all. We merely wanted to get together the information that would help us to clarify who we were. And we had just such an incredible outpouring, not from Portland, the people in Portland were very good, but from people outside who couldn't understand why we would even want to know those things. And then many people began to run for the exits again because they felt ashamed that we called attention to the fact that we were African people. Uh, happily, Portland is back on track. Some school systems, and especially Detroit, I have to hand it to the school board in Detroit, to Kay Lovelace and people like that, to Brother uh, Kwesi Ohini from uh, the Association for Classical African Civilization, to many people who are in our holy royal family, been with me to Egypt, uh, and to the uh, uh, community. This is probably the best informed African community, maybe in the world, in Detroit. You say, well, I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> how is that possible? You say, uh, you know, wouldn't that be New York? Wouldn't that be some other places? Well, there are pockets in every place. And of course, everybody in Detroit doesn't know everything that they ought to know. But I don't know a school district that had 4,000 people on a curriculum of inclusion other than Detroit. In fact, I don't even know a professional organization other than that, that equal what used to happen here in Detroit every year on the African Child Placed in Crisis, that conference, where you bring together the scholars from all over the world who can fill in the gap. That happened here. Didn't even happen in New York. I used to run a conference called The Infusion of African and African American Content in School Curriculum in Atlanta. And the highest we ever reached was 1,000 people. Actually, 2,000 people. We reached 2,000. You had 4,000 here at, in the last few years almost on a routine basis. You have a serious uh, attention being paid to the museums and so forth. This is in, indeed a core community for so much of the revolutionary ideas for African people. And I think you really ought to be proud of what you do. And it ought to be exported everywhere. And even more broadly exported here in um, the city of Detroit. You had one of the giants of this kind of thinking who just passed this last week, Brother Jeremoji, from the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to read the book that he wrote many years ago called Black Christian Nationalism. And then to look at the example of the shrine in Houston and to look at the example of the shrine in Atlanta and to look at the example of the shrine in Detroit and the kind of impact that they have had in changing people's lives and in changing the communities around them, operating in love and also with pride, and the kind of pride that makes them want to be self-determining people, owning property, uh, building schools, uh, doing all kinds of things that a full community would do. And see, we, what we need to do to get to that point is to uh, take charge of the education of our children. You know here in Detroit, I know in the area of Detroit that there are people in the United States who want to make money off of poor people, especially poor black people. They're organizing right now to take over public education. And when they take over public education, you will have no control over the curriculum that's offered to your children.
Already we're distant from our children, even with the arrangements that we have right now. It's very hard for boards to have the kind of control that they want to have over the curriculum that we wish to offer. It will be even harder when the board has no say other than to buy from a vendor something that has been put out as an initial public offering on Wall Street with companies that are funded at the level of $200 million to put into practice um, uh, the kinds of privatization that means that someone outside this community will be running the lives of your children. Or on the internet, I saw a company that will be coming out very soon, and they'll have something like, uh, um, tw well, they'll have all 12 years. You, you, they, do it, they did it first for private uh, schools, for homeschooling where you have 12 years of school that you can go to on the internet. You don't even have to show up in school. But in order to put out that kind of operation, you have to have a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars. But what will be in the curriculum that the children will be offering? Many of us are so trusting, uh, in fact, sometimes so lazy, that we turn our children over to anybody and allow them to raise our children. They will never teach them the memories of Africa. They will never teach them the glories of African civilization. They will never teach them the values of African people. We owe that to our children ourselves. I don't even want them to do that. Understand me now. I don't, I don't want to turn over to someone who doesn't know the history of African people teaching the history to my children. I want someone who knows the history, who is committed to the history, and who is committed to our people doing that job for us. We have the opportunity. We have the opportunity, and we even have the models. We have the models in Detroit. We have the models in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. We have the models in Atlanta. We made, uh, um, one of our board members started a project called the Infusion of African Content in School Curriculum. And, then, uh, and that board member uh, had a request from the superintendent for, I think it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. And the board said no. You can't have $250,000 to do the curriculum in Atlanta. You have to take a million. So they got a million dollars instead of $200,000 to produce the African curriculum in Atlanta. A million dollars per year. And so they did some things that were very important. We produced television shows. We have a series, 12, uh, uh, 10 programs, 10 half hour programs that have been aired over public television, which is the kind of stories that we have put together so we can inform not just African people, because African history is world history. It's a history that has influenced everyone. And we want everyone to know what that's all about, not just African people. And they have done that. They have financed that with uh, the uh, work of the Board of Education in, uh, in, in Atlanta. We see, unfortunately, that we had to fight like dogs to get universities, 